All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the dot. Uh, we have a great group of individuals joining us today, and so I think we'll get started. Uh, I have with me today my colleagues, Peter, if you'd like to say a quick hello. Hey, everyone. Good morning. And we have special guest Rich with us today. Rich, if you'd like to say a, a quick hello and a little bit about yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, Rich Ellis here. I'm a solutions consultant here at AppSheet. Um, and um, yeah, I uh, basically help uh, large companies develop their, their solutions uh, using the AppSheet platform. Excellent. Thank you, Rich. And Rich has been essential in providing a few sample apps in the community recently, which we'll touch on a little bit later today. And uh, if we have not met before, my name is Jennifer. I work very closely with Peter, uh, and we'll go ahead and get started for you. And Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, and so um, we're we're getting things introduced here for the webinar, and we see there there are a number of people still joining in. So for um, for those of you still logging in, we have a poll posted right now that is just a, a survey to see how many apps you've actually created, and uh, this helps us get a little bit of benchmark for uh, for who's joined today and the level of experience. And generally, what we see is around half the people joining are, are very early stages of getting started with AppSheet. And the other half have, have been around for a little bit longer and have created a few applications at least and are looking for a little bit of a deeper dive. And so the goal for today uh, and for most office hours is to bring up some, some relevant subjects that either come up in the community or that, um, uh, that, that we know are just good, uh, good features or functionality to demonstrate, but also to do a lot of live Q&A. And so in order to do that, We've posted, um, there's a thread in the community. Um, and actually, before we get to that, let's switch over and just show a little bit of this. Now let's shut down this poll and let's see here. And I think uh, I think the results might be showing for everyone right now, but I think it gives you a good sense. We've got the uh, majority of people have started creating, uh, have started creating some apps and so they've got um, you know, maybe a couple, uh, one, one or a couple, and then some people that are just getting started. So, just as kind of a frame of reference, this is who's here today. Um, so let's switch over. I'm going to share my screen, and uh, just as a little bit of housekeeping, the best way, as we're thinking about Q and A, I think the best way to do this is to get familiar with the AppSheet community. And if you haven't been there yet, um, the community is just a community.appsheet.com. And uh, Jen, Jen, I think you posted a particular thread just for this office hours, right? I uh, correct. I posted the thread uh, for this specific session for April fifth, or excuse me, April seventh. Okay, so I just went to the announcements section, and I'm opening up the uh, the office hours post for this thread. This is going to be the best place. You'll see this float to the top in the community. But if you have questions for during this session. If you can post them here, that would be ideal because that will allow everyone to chime in with uh, with help. But we'll also be monitoring this thread uh, really closely and be answering live uh, throughout the webinar. There's also a, the ability in the GoToWebinar control panel to ask questions. And so if you if you only have access to that right now, we'll also keep an eye there. And just to add on to that specific community thread, uh, once this session is complete today, uh, we'll make a few edits to the video to clean it up and then post uh, this webinar recording on this community thread uh, for you to reference later as well. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. So I guess while we're here, Jen, uh, would you um, mind describing some of the, um, you know, some of the COVID related resources that we've been publishing recently? Absolutely. Uh, so a team at AppSheet, along with many of our uh, Google colleagues, have been working to find a way that we can use our product to help alleviate uh, some of the issues caused by the COVID, um, COVID outbreak coming circulating the globe right now. So uh, Peter, if you'd actually like to pull up the COVID community um, category for the group. Yeah we can show. So we have uh, two different resources essentially available. One is our preliminary 
COVID-19 guide, which you'll be able to find that resource um, on our website and also within this COVID community category. But this category is dedicated specifically to individuals building sample applications, trying to coordinate efforts, um, looking for additional resources or help leveraging AppSheet to combat uh, the current pandemic. This has been a really uh, great experience for our team to see uh, our community not only step up to the plate, but to see what this platform is capable in this type of high pressure environment. We've seen some really, really cool efforts come out of this. Um, Rich is gonna talk about some of what he's been working on a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, we're really excited to see what's available or what, what you all are creating. And then just one additional note, um, there is a post in here on um, our resource guide, which does speak to apps that are built specifically for these COVID efforts. You'll be able to deploy at no cost. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to post in the community or send us an email and we'll be able to get you some answers. Great, thanks, Jen. And I, I just wanted to also switch over um, uh, I just want to pull up this landing page here. This is this is uh, a lot of what you're describing are, uh, is consolidated onto this page. It's a link in the community and linked from our from our website. And uh, this this has some of what you're describing. Uh, one one particular call out is a promotion for anyone that is building COVID related apps. Um, uh, there's there are promotional codes for that. Um, and then I guess you know something that. Uh, uh, um, uh, that we can kind of preface Rich's demonstration with is we do have a directory of applications that people are contributing. And at the top of that directory is Rich's uh, COVID community support app. And so that's what we'll, we'll get to uh, shortly. Um, but that this is what uh, Rich will be able to dive into a little bit more, uh, show how it works and describe a little bit of behind the scenes what, uh, what went into it. Um, Jen, was there anything else uh, that uh, that uh, that was related to this you'd like to bring up, or should we uh, dive into the editor? Uh, aside from saying a quick thank you to everyone who's contributed so far, um, I think I think we're all set to go. All right. So I think just as a for those people that are newer to AppSheet and that maybe are just starting to build applications. We wanted to just start with a very uh, quick run through of the editor, sort of a level set of this is what we're going to explore today. And here are some high level ways of, of thinking about different parts of the product. And then um, after that, I think let's switch over and we'll, we'll dig into Rich's app and see what a real uh, app creator creates. Now that we've got finally some, some expertise on this webinar, uh, we, can, we can grill him and uh, get, get your questions ready. And then, uh, then there are some other uh, topics that um, are, are generally broadly related to supporting remote workers, and that's the that's the theme. And that those are some of the, the topics that we're we're trying to help uh, app creators uh, address uh, lately. And so there are some of the items there that we can try running through uh, towards the end of the session. Um, and again, just emphasize: ask ask early and ask often. Uh, any questions that's coming to mind. Um, and I, I think just to confirm, we're getting a couple of questions about audio. If anyone can confirm that that their audio is working okay, um, if there are isolated issues, uh, you will get a recording afterwards, just in case uh, your audio right now is not working for you. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. All right, let's switch over to the app sheet editor, and we're just we'll just do a kind of a, a five to ten minute walkthrough of what we're looking at, and to do that, I've opened up an application. Um, let's see, that I'm calling uh, just Med Supply Exchange. And we're not gonna get into the real granular nuances of what this application is doing, but I wanna kinda take a step back and uh, take a look at how it's set up and what are different pieces of the editor um, being used in order to uh, support this application. And this is, we'll, we'll run through the, the kind of the prime sections here and uh, set the stage for then looking at a, a little bit more robust app like Rich's. So this is the app sheet editor. And um, the, the, from a very high level, 
most people will land in the AppSheet editor from one of two places. They're, they'll either find AppSheet on, on the website and they'll sign up. And then the first step that you want to take in your app building process is to determine what data are you going to be building from? What is What data is your application gonna be connected to? Um, and, and so that's one path. Another path that's very common and similar is you may be working in your in uh, Google uh, Sheet, for example, uh, and then you may find App Sheet in the add-on marketplace, and you could launch it directly from your data, and that will bring you into the editor as well. It'll land you right in the same place, um, but uh, however you enter App Sheet, the first step is really thinking about what data is connected, um, and then very rapidly you're going to want to define uh, how those different columns, how the different fields in your data um, are defined, what are those data types, how are they formatted, and then you can you can start getting into some pretty granular um, controls around how that data is exposed, how it shows up, what are the labels assigned to it, etc. We'll dig into some of that a little bit later. But in this particular case, we have an application with a few different views. And the general premise is that there are you know, thousands of clinics around the country. There are different types of supplies that, they may, that may be common at those clinics. And then there may be people uh, who work at those clinics who are logging in and posting, hey, I, we're low on this supply, or hey, we have a surplus of this supply. And an application like this might help uh, those clinics collaborate and send resources back and forth as, as they need to. So uh, very, very broadly, what, what is going on here is we just have a few different tables in a Google Sheet, one with it, which is a big table of clinics. We have those commonly uh, used items. We have a log of people posting, whether they have a surplus or a, a demand for different items. And then I just included an about tab here, which just basically gives a direct uh, a link to the data source I used for this uh, urgent care directory. Um, so when you when you open up the editor, the first thing and, and where you're going to spend most of your time early on is connecting that data. Connecting the data is quick, but then defining what you're going to do with it and how you're going to expose those tables in the end interface of your application. This is where you're going to start spending some time. So at first, I'm spending a lot of time in columns, just making sure that um, the different column types match the type of data that I have in the tables I've connected. So a good example of this is I have down here for the clinics, I have uh, XY, so lat long coordinates, um, and I wanna make sure that that is actually a lat long column type. And I want to make sure I want to do that because then, as I start defining my interface, uh, I'm only going to be able to build a map if I have location data uh, defined here. Um, and so there are a variety of things here. We can we can dig into this a little bit more. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind early on with your defining your data is uh, what kind of level of permission uh, to modify that data are you setting up right from the start. And so very simply, can you update, add, or delete rows from this table? That's important to define early on. And then we'll talk about security filters a little later. Um, but so, you know, uh, are, are, is any of this data very sensitive? And we'll, we'll look at that. Once that's, um, once that's defined here, everything that you're doing in the application to create views or to build workflows or actions, it really stems from those tables you've defined. So in this case, I've made a clinics view and it's a map and everything is based off of, okay, well, what table uh, did you connect and define? And that's what we're gonna build this interface, this view from. The same is true for behaviors. And so if I want to create an action, for example, showing up here, then I'm going to base it on one of those tables, and that's where it's going to show up. That's where that action will be most relevant. Um, the same is true for workflows. So if I'm defining some uh, automation here, in this case, I'm automatically sending an email 
And again, it's based on activity in one of those particular tables. So um, we'll, we'll revisit this and we, we'll dig in to uh, look a little bit more closely at, at how this is set up. But I just wanted to set the stage a little bit. And um, I think it, uh, Jen and Rich, um, just for getting this set up and, and starting to explore the editor a little bit, is there any, any other real important points that you think would be good uh, from a high level to be thinking about bef before we move into Rich's demo? I would add one resource that I always like to call out. And Peter, if you can click on uh, the blue little smiley face box in the bottom left-hand corner. Yeah. So this resource down here uh, contains a number of helpful ways, especially for those that are new to the platform, uh, to learn more about AppSheet and discover uh, new ways to learn about this particular platform and really take a quick deep dive in uh, to uh, activate what you're trying to do very, very quickly. Uh, we have uh, Getting Started the Essentials Guide, which is essentially a list of every resource, including our online Udemy course, which I think takes less than 90 minutes to take. It's essentially a 100 level free course uh, to do a deep dive into this platform. So I highly recommend leveraging that resource while you're learning and getting acquainted uh, with the editor. Awesome, thanks, Jen. So there's a lot more to dig into here and, and um, We'll, uh, we'll open up this application later and kind of show some of the functionality and, and how it's set up. But I'd, I'd really like to look at Rich's app. Um, and I think, Rich, does that sound good to you? Or is there anything else uh, from a high level that you'd like to, to kind of open up with? No, I, I think we're good. All right, let me um, go ahead and switch over so that you can present. So those of you that have been active in the COVID category within the AppSheet community, this application that Rich is going to show might look a little familiar uh, for you, but he's going to do a deeper dive on it to provide some additional context and, and talk through how it works. All right. Okay, it looks like my screen is sharing, so that's good. Uh, we'll jump into it. So, uh, as, as Peter said at the beginning of the call, this this app can be found. The sample app can be found in the uh, COVID-19 sample app directory. And when you you open up the sample app, you'll be taken to this page here that should be familiar if you've browsed the the sample app section before. And um, you'll simply, you know, set up this this app to copy it and and customize it. To, to get rolling. And the whole basis behind this app design was to get anyone up and running, even without AppSheet experience. So if you know nothing about AppSheet platform and you're a community organizer, or you wanna organize something in your community, this app was set up to basically have a novice get, step, uh, get set up in nine steps below without having to set up tables or anything like that or customize anything. Uh, all the customization basically happens inside the app itself. So we're trying to make this as easy as possible for, for folks to organize in their local community. All right, so. And um, Rich, yeah. Rich, can I just add on to here? So for those that are newer, I wanna make it really clear that when we talk about sample apps and copying sample apps, it becomes a separate instance that you can customize and you can have a different user base for um, sometimes that gets, uh, it's hard to, it gets lost in the way we communicate about apps and who owns them and who's inviting who to them. But these are really, you can think of these as templates, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's a, and, yeah. yeah I think, point, I think Peter. for yeah. those that are newer, I think it's good to be thinking about it in those ways. Right. Yeah. And, and this kind of fits, you know, app sheets really, you know, geared toward this idea because you could have these basically thousands and thousands of these clones of these community supports for each small community. And that way you don't have to worry about, you know, data being controlled by any one large organization. It's, you know, your data locally. So, <clears throat> um, so, so basically to get started into this demo, um, I'm first gonna, if, if you're looking to use this community support app, um, 
we're going to skip over steps one through six because it just involves making a copy of the app, which you know is fairly self-explanatory. So we're going to pretend like I, I accomplished steps one through six here, which goes through those steps in detail. And we're going to jump over to the cloned app, right? So I've made a, a copy and let me shrink the screen down here just to put the app um, itself into focus for the time uh, for the time being, and then we'll get into some of the app editor stuff after the demo. So after you've uh, fully set up your copied instance of of your community support app, the app will open up and it will ask you to set up coordinators, right? So there are three different roles in that this app has been set up with. One's a coordinator, which is basically your admin for the app that can do everything that is possible in the app. You have helpers and then you have requesters. So you have those three different tiers, right? Requesters basically make requests to the community. Helpers are the ones that volunteer to help the folks that have requests in the community. And the coordinators are your admins that uh, basically moderate and make sure that uh, there's no abuse going on in the community as well. <clears throat> so when you first get into the app, it's gonna ask you to set up coordinators and you simply you know, add the button, you know, add the button here and it's going to ask you what services as a coordinator you you would like to offer if you do and you know end up helping folks uh, you could check as many options as you want and um, enter your name so I'm going to put my name in this case and then my email is down below and your address too as a helper so that information is available uh, to folks that are, are, are looking for help. So you could you could basically you, you know use any any street corner that you want. So in this case, we'll just use you know some um, any any street street corner in in America or your address or a business. So many people might not know this that you don't have to just enter an address into an address field. You could also enter in um, a store or a business, right? If you're close by, there might be some people that are concerned with their privacy. So, you know, maybe they'll just enter in uh, something, some place that's next to their, their where they live. So get entered in this address and then we'll just enter in a generic phone number. And then down below, they can select what kind of alerts they wanna receive, whether they wanna see the text alert or email alert uh, or both. Once they have that filled out, they could hit send and it logs that individual as a coordinator and you can continue adding additional coordinators too. So if you're an organizer, you want additional folks helping out, you could add them as well. And then when you're done adding coordinators, you could click finish setup and it's gonna you know, basically say it's ready to go and ask you to click this flag in the bottom right corner. And when you click it, it'll take you into the app itself. So this is me as a coordinator logged into the community support app. Along the bottom, you'll see options to view my details, which will show you basically what you've entered on the previous form. So information about yourself, what your role is, what services are offered. You could also update that information, you know, if you decide to help out with other, you know, details. Um, and um, yeah, so on and so forth. You could also click, I need help myself. So you might need some assistance yourself and you could click that to fill out a form to get help. Then in the middle, you see matched requests. So these are all the requests that came from the field that are, are matched um, basically to what you've, you've specified you're willing to help out with. Um, and then the, the fourth item here is a signed request where you, be, you, know, you basically see any requests that you've picked up or you've been assigned. And then the map feature, as I kind of shown, which shows the helpers in blue um, with the blue icons, yellow icons as requests that are, are fresh, and then red, the red pins, I should say, are the, the red pins are overdue items that are basically, you know, they're, they're, they haven't been fulfilled yet and those folks uh, need, need that help, all right? And then opening up the side menu as a coordinator, you also can filter by overdue requests. 
to see exactly what those overdue requests are. So you could pursue those as a coordinator to get them help. Um, they could view all requests uh, grouped by status. You could also manage users in the um, in the app, which we don't have any you know additional users yet. And you could also manage coordinators if you decide to add coordinators later. You can do that as well. And then if you want to change help types as well, you can also add. You know, maybe say you you have another uh, different type you want to add uh, to the list of options that your community would like to support. You can add that too as an item. Okay, and then under settings, there's some some settings in the background too that you could basically specify whether you you want to reset up the app as coordinators and basically wipe the app clean or uh, define what late is. So uh, by default, 24 hours is late, or you could you know change that to whatever you want that fits your community needs. Okay, so that's myself as a coordinator. I'm going to um, go into this next part, which is I'm gonna log in as a new person. So I'm gonna use this pre us function in AppSheet where I could essentially mimic being another email address and view this app as a person that has never signed up and, for uh, the just app to, yet. Just to touch on what Rich is doing right now, he's showcasing how different user roles are able to interact with this platform. Yeah, and we, yeah. we can certainly provide more information on this as, if this is a topic of interest for the community. Rich, just to uh, just to tease a future to a future topic here, is this um, are you using security filters to? Yeah. Uh, okay. So basically, just for whoever logs into the application, it's going to cater the content and filter the content to just be relevant to them. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll open All that right. up then shortly. So, so typically, what a a new user would see, the one 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 thing that's not actually showing is the map. There'd be a map view for new folks if they open the app for the first time. But because we were using this preview as function, it's still showing the settings screen. But imagine a, a map being here and. New folks will basically have these two options at the bottom. I need help or sign up to help. That's it. So they're not overwhelmed by additional views or anything like that. That would be confusing. So we'll say that this new person needs help and they're going to say, okay, I need medicine collection and the uh, medicine picked up from pharmacy. Um, and then, you know, we'll say John Doe is the name along with their sixth street and i don't know um i don't know what a good street is <laughs> um we'll just call it seattle washington to keep them if there is a sixth street right um and then you know they could enter their phone number in as well um so they could be contacted and just like the coordinators they could choose what kind of alerts they'll receive as part of their um signing up for this platform uh, and they click send and that request goes off and it shows up um, in the pool of, of requests that are out there. So that's, that's essentially all there is to be in somebody that needs help. They could basically get help quickly. And once they've put in a request in the system, the community will, uh, the community app will basically store their personal information that they've entered. Um, so they can go in and update that information in the bottom right, right corner in the future as well, or even volunteer to help too, if they decide to actually help out too. Um, they could quickly flip their role to a helper as well if they choose to do that. Um, and then they could, in the bottom right corner here, see my request. They could basically see a list of all requests they've entered, along with adding new requests as well, using this plus button in the bottom right corner. Okay, so that was... That was the user uh, logging in as a, a new person that needed help, right? So next we're gonna show what the helper role looks like. So we're gonna say this uh, email address is new helper as a person that's logging in. So they'll be greeted with the same screen as a new person, right? I need help 
with the options, I need help or sign up to help, right? So in this case, we're gonna click sign up to help and they're gonna select their you know, services that they're offer. So we're gonna say medicine collection, maybe they find a doctor, you know, they'll help uh, posting email or something like that. So we'll say these three options are what they would use. And we'll say Jane Doe is the one um, helping out in this request. And then we'll, we'll say 14th uh, Street in uh, Seattle, Washington, okay. And then phone number again, uh, and the same receiving alerts options as before. Okay, so after that helper is signed up, uh, the app logs their information once again, and after the app syncs, so you basically see the same options that I showed you as uh, coordinator down below. And after the app syncs with their, their match preferences, it'll show up here in this middle view. So everything that they basically said they were willing to help out with, they'll see the request all consolidated here in this view, along with, you know, map pins showing where those those helpers basically need help or their, their general vicinity to give them some frame of reference. So we'll say that as a helper, they'll, they'll want to help out with this medicine collection and they can review the information on that request and they say, yeah, I want to help John. And they'll say, all right, do you agree to help? Will be a confirmation here and they'll click help. And then it gets logged in the system as this helper, Jane Doe, is uh, helping John Doe um, fill this request. So that's how you would, you know, basically set up, uh, basically accept requests as a helper in the system. Uh, you could also then see all your requests that you've accepted, kind of what I hinted on uh, previously as a coordinator. You'd be able to see your assigned request here or view a map of, you know, basically where all the requests are. Um, in that that local area um so um this is, this is awesome yeah. rich that thanks oh. for um i think this is uh really helpful and and for especially to be able to use this preview as i think this is something that uh i think uh, kind of flies under the radar a little bit but is this is like a perfect example of switching between those different roles and like testing how the app is going to function uh, as different people, which sometimes can it can get very hard to uh, interpret uh, without without knowing how to use that. So that that in particular, I think it's helpful to see. Um, okay. Is can uh, can we? I I have a few questions. So behind the scenes, like sure. thinking about how this is set up and and what are some kind of key concepts that were necessary in order to make this work. Um, if um, can I go ahead and, and Jen, unless you see any uh, specific questions to this right now that, uh, from the community? Yeah, I've actually got one. Um, okay. So an application like this, Rich, could you use a local language instead of English? Uh, you, yeah, you, I mean, you could using, um, you, you could basically set that up. Um, you'd have to set it up manually though. I mean, it wouldn't be as easy as selecting a different language you would need to go into the app editor and we have some uh, help topics that go over this, but you would you would go under uh, the UX section and under localize, basically set up your your um, text in your your you know in whatever language you're looking to accomplish. Once you do that, um, you, you would then need to go into the views themselves under each of the views and hopefully I'm not I'm, you know leaving anyone in the dust with this but you know that basically going into the views and for each view you would need to scroll down to the bottom of and where this display section is and enter a display name with your you know the the language that you're you're basically going to use in there so there'd be you know there it would it would be tedious to do but it's possible and I would, different language. I would add, Rich is saying tedious, but this is a no-code platform. And so if anyone's a developer by trade 
or has experience with low code platforms, you're probably seeing this and thinking, this is actually really simple <laughs> compared to what I might have had to have done previously. Uh, so just, just for context, when we say tedious snap sheet, it is nothing like developing an application. Sure. It's a very different mindset. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm in you know, the app sheet world. So my view on tedious is maybe a, a couple of hours versus you know, like six months. <laughs> yeah, versus six months, right? So, yeah. the, the localization that is, that is good to be familiar with. And I, I correct me, Rich, if if um, uh, if you see other stuff, if you see otherwise. But um, one of the first places is within the localization, just getting kind of like the key functions of the app localized. So, for example, uh, when it says save or submit, or or if there are particular actions with with um, words that need to be translated sometimes even just like that base layer as opposed to translating the entire app um, can can make the difference for a user um, what sure uh, I think it's a good I think it's a good question though I, and, and you know I'm willing if if there's any folks out there that are looking to do this um, you know this this could potentially add to the this this demo app we could basically set up tables to have many different translations for this app mm. um, for for folks that I could basically do the I could set up the app if, if there's anyone interested out there we have a community support app uh, forum going and we could be I could basically set up this app to reference a table and then the table can just be populated with the different languages and then you, we could potentially have this app set up to easily switch back and forth uh, between different languages so it'd be an interesting experiment to try if, if any if any folks are interested out there in helping me do that and or you know multilingual then um, I'd be glad to help build the, the base support for that idea yeah we've got okay. an offer for somebody willing to help in Danish and um, if anyone else would like to uh, raise their hand to offer to help with translations we'd encourage you to post on that community thread and just identify who you are and what language you can help with uh, the translation process for and and we'll try to reach out um rich yeah. i do have one other question about this app in terms of maps and it's how can this work in a locality where the streets are not uh, really found that easily with maps do you want to talk about a little bit how um where our maps information comes from yeah, uh, map, maps information comes from um, our Google Maps, right? So, yeah, if if if, the, if there are no street information there, that's a that's another concern, I guess, to 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 look in. I mean, the you can put in cities, or if there's any points of of interest that would show up on Google Maps, those can be used by by these apps, right? Now, if, if Google Maps has, you know, no information in your community and it's blank, um, then we would we would need to look at setting up lat long uh, column types for the map. So you can basically use the, you know, a satellite view and drop pins on the map. Um, so that's basically um, that's something that you know we, we 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 can look at too to make this app more flexible for, you know, everywhere in the world. Awesome. So, um, Rich, can we can we dive into some of the kind of the key functionality that you built into this, and and like some of the basics for what you had to do in order to make it happen? Uh, and yeah, so, and I like the first thing that comes to mind is just revisiting the the idea of security filters and what it means for this app. Um, that was one thing that we had jotted down as as a good topic for today. Thinking about um, I think it's it's there's a heightened awareness of like personal security as as different teams are thinking about sharing information about individuals in order to help share resources or get requests. Um, and I think it's you know it's super relevant for what for what you've built here. And um, do you want to maybe just like start with kind of a high level of like what is the data connected and then who should sure. have access to which parts? Yeah, so we'll we'll start with the data tables um, just to kind of go over this. And there's actually not a lot to this, um, so that should hopefully ease in the learning curve. We have a, a people table, right? So this keeps track of all the information uh, for anyone that's basically signed up in the app. It'll track, you know, their role, whether they're a coordinator, requester, or helper, the services that that 
they have volunteered to offer, along with their name, their location, email, and phone number, and their date started and communication preferences. So that, that's basically, you know, the people part of the app, how the app remembers the information for future requests and stuff like that. Um, the next tab is your request itself. So these are the, the you know, the requests that come from the field. Um, there's a, an ID and, you know, most of these IDs. So, you know, in the, in the people table, there's an ID, there's a people uh, column that's an ID. And we basically use this column, uh, this option over email address because uh, there, there is some consideration for people that may not want to share an email address. Maybe they just want to share a phone number. And uh, that was intentionally designed that way to, to use that as the, the, you know, use an ID, a random number as an ID to give that flexibility if, if folks want to set up their app a little differently. Um, but basically, yeah, the, these are all hidden anyway in the background. They're just used by the app itself and they're not shown um, by um, by you know two people in the app. There's a request number that's randomly generated, and this is purely just to have a, a human readable uh, number format that's easier to communicate over phone or something like that. It gets really difficult if you were going to try to communicate request ID uh, to folks over the phone. You can see you know there's a lot of you have to use the phonetic alphabet, you know, <laughs> so it's a little easier than from a design standpoint to make something more human readable too. Um, as an option. And you basically, these request types and, you know, descriptions, they're all self-explanatory and, and they're the fields that get captured uh, for a request, right? Um, and then there's the types table, right? So this is a table that can be edited in the app itself where you can add additional request types for your community. And then there's a setting section and you know, this, this can be expanded as well. There's a lot of creative stuff you can do by having a settings table in an app. If you're designing an app that you wanna be managed internally within the app. So it just makes setup a lot easier if you, you've designed your app to reference other tables. Um, you could, you could you make, make onboarding a lot easier for folks. So that's right. um, the table, the, the table setup, just four simple tables uh, for this app. Okay, um, and then as, as Peter was talking about before, security filters are basically um, for requests are, are, are how we control what, what data is viewed by different rules, right? So folks that are, are just requesting information from the system, they really only need to see their, their role. They are their, their requests they put in, they don't need to see anyone else's requests. So we, we designed these security filters to, to look at that. And there's a simple, you know, I don't say simple formula, right? But it's basically there's an if then statement that looks at different, uh, the different roles that folks are logged in as, which you can see here. And there's more information in the, the community, um, the help docs, which kind of go over these if statements and select statements, but you could set up these security um, filters to one, to not only, you know, basically block information from being downloaded to other people's devices that don't need to see it, but also improve the efficiency and, and speed of your app, right? So if you have a whole bunch of requests, well, you don't wanna bog down that information with someone trying to, you know, open the app up the first time. So the app, you know, information that gets downloaded to to folks um, as a new requester is very small compared to maybe what a coordinator would need to download who might have a little bit more patience um, for the app. So those are just some design considerations of why you would use a security filter. But yeah, primarily is to, to basically restrict information uh, from getting in the hands of other folks. That's, that's super helpful. Thanks, Rich. And I, maybe just to, to add one more detail to that, um, if in this scenario, if, if anyone was sharing real sensitive inf information, um, there is a way in the in your column definition. So for the column, let's say that there's a column for, um, well, honestly, for all the personal details could be considered PII. 
Sure. And um, and so I'm trying that, to show that Peter. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, for uh, yeah, at the very bottom there, there's like a sensitive data toggle, and so I think this is a good case where you know we're we are not the best to provide guidance on uh, when when data you're you're working with is PII or not. Um, but I think it's good to be familiar with this and then err on the side of caution. And this gives you the ability to uh, kind of mark those particular columns and those fields as PII. And that will encrypt that data and remove it from the audit logs of your application. So that uh, it just adds another layer of um, of security there, Rich. Is that um, is that is that a good way of describing yep. it? Yeah, right. that's a good way of describing it. It's good. Um, so, um, just a quick check in with uh, with questions in the community. Uh, Jen, Jen, do you see anything that uh, that we should we should try to d dive into? Yeah, um, I've got I've got a good one from Manny who just put posted and he asks, can users just use their regular email address to access the applications and data or do they have to have a Gmail account? Oh, good one. So that's Rick. that's a that's a good question, right? So all the apps this this sample app was was set up to basically authenticate through any of AppSheet supported services, whether it's Box or Dropbox or Google or Microsoft. Um, this app, you know, anyone with those email addresses can log in through those services. Now, uh, one of the ideas that I was throwing around in my head, you can also make this sample app public. So there is no need to log in. And uh, you basically, you know, ask, what people's email addresses are, so they don't need to sign up for a service as well. So that's Rich, a you know design consideration there. Can we, can we actually take a look at um, you know for example the user section of this app and just show how yep. some of that might get turned on? Yep. So so at the very base level of your app, right? So you have your user section here. So I'm in the user section, and under the user tab in the app, right? So Typically, you can add individual users to to your app if if you desire to to basically set it to a select few, or you can select that any provider. Uh, you can select you know specific providers. So here's a list of all the providers that AppSheet offers, or you can open it up so they could you know basically if a user has any of those accounts, um, you can authenticate through that. Now, if you wanted to make this completely public you would you would go to manage um and um sorry hold on nope security let me find myself here <laughs> <laughs> security uh the security section and the re require sign-in tab here and you would switch off require sign-in okay and then there's gonna be a couple questions that get asked below because we really want to make sure you know what you're doing and not opening up your, your, you know, any potential data to to the public, right? So you want to make sure that you're confirming that this app is public and that you basically set the right security filters in place to use your data. And then you're going to say that you're authorized to set up an insecure app, right? So you always want to do this to in, in the right context, right? And make sure that you have very limited user information that would ever possibly be exposed. and making sure you use those security filters and that PII option as well um, to to protect your users of your apps. Got it, thanks. And, and actually there's a, there's a good follow-up question to that that I saw um, regarding, uh, just thinking the differences between security filters and slices. And um, I'll, I'll call out one difference, but then Rich, I'm curious to get your take. Um, First and foremost, from a performance standpoint, security filters are the way to go. If you're thinking about uh, an app that uh, is connected to large, like large data sets, security filters are going to help with performance, and uh, and slices are not. And just to introduce the idea of slices, it's basically a filtered view of a table or a filtered version of a table. Um, but uh, yeah, so so in the data yeah. section and in slices, that's where you can create those and um, 
Rich, do you um, it just as far as security is concerned, um, it, you know the I, I I think the security filters are best to it's uh, the best place to think about security aspects. But how do you yep. think about slices? So yeah, one one thing I would so I'm I'm typically avoid I typically avoid slices when I'm making more complex apps to where you know to the extent possible, right? I will always try to use a security filter if I can apply uh, any logic to basically the whole app, because that makes customization throughout the whole app easier in the future. The more complex that you make an app, you're simply, you can make tweaks to the security filter and have it automatically update through the whole app without having to make individual tweaks to your slices. If you define a more restrictive criteria in your security filter, your slice doesn't need to contain that information at all. And it could just be um, any additional, basically, filter that needs to be placed on top of the security filter. So that's probably a better way to think about it. I would, you, you should really only be using slices, in my opinion, when you're looking to filter additional data for like, you know, open requests, like I have open here. I have a slice for open requests because I wanted to have a view that shows just open request, right? And that's not something I could do at a security filter level because that would apply to the whole app, right? Every view in the app. So that would be a good case to have a slice for that view. But in, in general, you know, if you're creating slices to have uh, different column orders and stuff like that, I would only do that if there's a rare case um, to do that because just remember that the more you add into the app, the more complex it gets. And if you start throwing different slices on it, it just makes it very difficult to to update in the future without possibly making an error or something like that that'll affect your user base. So and slices and security are something we could do entire series of webinars on, and we'd be happy to take that challenge on in the future. Uh, but Rich, I wanted to pivot just a little bit, if you're okay with that, and touch on a topic that we didn't get a chance to get to in the last office hours, and there's been a lot of interest in this time, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, Peter, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, in terms of Google Docs, actually, and how those work uh, with AppSheet applications. Sure, yeah. So this is uh, this is something that came up, and actually, Rich, if we can just hang on your screen, and do you mind opening a tab? I think the easiest way to talk about this is to open the community post about it. So if you open a new tab and, and in the community, um, if you search for, let's see, um, uh, Google Docs and Tricks, I think, uh, or just Google, Google Docs, Tricks, I think this should be what shows up. Google Docs um, and Data Tricks. Yeah, there it is. So I've been adding some ideas to this over time, and I just wanted to call this out because what, something we haven't talked about is, yet in this session is actions. Um, so I, this is this is a uh, kind of a 180 from what we were talking about with Rich's app, but this this has come up a few times, and I think it's great, especially as we're thinking about everybody is dispersed and having uh, easier ways to work within Google Docs. Google Docs are great for collaboration. Uh, and um, and so I think thinking about how to connect those to your apps uh, could be handy. And so just one quick call out to this particular post, if you are interested in it, it it um, there are some uh, uh, links that and actually, Rich, are you able to zoom in a little bit on those? The if you look at number four, um, there are just some ideas there for quick links for creating. Uh, different types of Google Docs. So it could be a sheet or a doc or a presentation, um, I think even a drawing. And those links also allow you to specify a default folder. So one example is like when I'm working um, in my application, I have like a note-taking application and I have an action that allows me just in one click to open up and create a new document in my notes folder. Um, and then, so then that's an easy link between my my uh, my notes app, which also logs the person I'm working with and maybe the meeting that I have set with them. So there's just just some creative ways there that you can incorporate uh, uh, some of this behavior into your application as actions. Um, and this post might help you out with that. 
Excellent. And I just posted a link to this post in uh, the community thread for today's office hour session too, for those that are okay. interested. What, um, and Jen, stop me if, if there's a, another item that you wanted to get to, um, there's, or, or that you see in the questions. One other thing I was curious about, because it's also, uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about recently, and I think it's just really apt for uh, remote workers right now, is the, the idea of notifications. Or, or email notifications or push notifications or text messages. And since that was something rich that you've built into that application, do you mind if we switch back and just take a, a quick high level look at how to think about notifying users? And then in the meantime, yeah, while you're sure. while you're switching back over there, uh, Jen, are there, um, and we're coming to the end of the hour here, but uh, are there any questions that we'll finish with? Uh, I think I may have one uh, left at the end of the hour. Okay, awesome. Okay, yeah, so, you know, there's there's probably a couple of considerations and, you know, obviously the sky's the limit, but when you're designing notifications, you, you want to make sure it's not too excessive, right? Because you don't want people to start ignoring. I think we all get those pop-up notifications on our phone and half of them we probably ignore. Um, or maybe that's just me, but um, <laughs> try to keep it succinct and um, and uh, to the point. But in this app, we basically set up notifications for request received and when there's a new helper needed um, that matches what a user's requested, right? So they're not going to see any of the other requests that come in that aren't what you know they're willing to help out with, and then they'll see. Uh, the, the requester will see a notification when they when someone basically picks up their request and they'll basically get some you know their phone number and somebody to contact and then they'll get a notification when the request was marked complete okay so try to design this um, to be as efficient as possible but what what how we did it was um, um, this is probably not a good one. So, um, sorry, do this. So you basically define, you know, this is a workflow rule and we're looking at the data called requests, right? So when a, there's an update event, right? So in this case, we're like any time that a new request comes in, so that would be an add to your data table, you would you would select this as an option, right? So as ads only, right? And we're gonna want all new ads, so we don't need to place additional conditions uh, in the condition because this is basically a confirmation that um, the request was received by the system to the user. Just your typical, with pretty much any service that you see, is some kind of e email confirmation so you know it went through. And you're gonna you know, basically set this as an email option here and into you know enter the column that's the email address you could you know typically with these workflows you can set a static email address or dynamically based on the column type so it's as simple as email uh entering the email column that you want the email to get sent to and then there's actually down below you can create templates um for sorry i'm trying to find okay yep yeah. You could either type in your notification in these fields in the email content section, or you can also, you could also set up a Google Docs or you know uh, uh, Microsoft Microsoft Word document to design your your email in in a Word doc. So let me show you one that was set up in a Word doc. So as a new helpers needed, we have this set up as a um, Google Sheet. So AppSheet will basically look at the, sorry, a Google Doc, I keep jumping around. We'll set up as a Google Doc and you, you specify, you know, basically what columns you want to see from the request. And nice this icons. would be how you format it. <laughs> nice icons. Sorry, what? Nice icons. Oh, yeah. And yeah, keep in mind, too, you could use the whole, you're not limited to text. 
you're also you could use any emoji icon out there that's supported by you know web web standards in your um, in your uh, workflow notifications. But this would be an example of setting up a um, basically a, a template for your emails to to go out, and you could make them as you know colorful or whatever you want to do. Um, gives you a little bit more flexibility when you're designing it in the, the Google Sheets. Rich, all right. Just, yep. Uh, just for the uh, sake of people that have to log off right now, this when you copy the app, everything about this workflow will be included with it, right? So they can sure. they can kind of yep. dig into it and customize it. That's correct. Okay, cool. J um, uh, just uh, for those people that uh, that do need to log off, since we are at the end of the hour. Um, I just wanted to call that out real quickly and and thank everyone. Uh, we had a great turnout today. Thank you for for showing up and participating. And I think um, uh, uh, I think we have uh, time to hang around a few more minutes and answer some questions. But uh, Jen, does that uh, does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, everyone who has to jump off now for participating and for those that can hang around. Um, we'll we'll do our best to answer some stuff quickly for you. Awesome, Rich. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, cut you off there with the workflow. Were there, were there um, other kind of key points with with how that was created that you wanted to get to? Uh, yeah. So, in addition to to this, we've also you noticed how we, I set up the the app to basically give two options, right? On what how folks should receive their their notifications, whether they wanted email or whether they wanted a, a text message, right? So these have been set up to to have um, text message as part of each workflow. There is an email component, so which would be action one, or there is a send text component, which is action two. And you may be asking, well, how do you control right when one goes out? One, you know, whether an email or text goes out. Well, that happens in the condition here. So this is a way to basically, because we've, we've asked the user to specify in a table, right, through, a, through the form when they sign up, whether they want text message or whether they want email, this condition will, will look at that. It'll look at, you know, whether the status is valid. And, um, um, well, this is not a good example, sorry. That, um, <laughs> let me, um, um, I think that's sorry. It's good. No, it's good to call no. out though that that it's right. It's based on what the user has selected when they submitted that form initially, right? Like they have, they've set whether they want, um, you know, uh, notifications or email notifications or both. Yeah. Yep. And that's what um, it's drawing from. Yeah. Shoot. I would have to. I'm. I'm having a. I'm having a brain. A brain cramp on. <laughs> what I actually did to make that possible at this time. <laughs> That's fine. So feel, we'll, yeah. We, um, we can we can open that up in the community and, and actually just show a screenshot and, and kind of dig into yeah. it if people want to follow up with it. Um, yeah, that's good. <clears throat> maybe um, on that note, since I, if, if you guys have a few minutes to hang around and just make sure there aren't any open questions, um, there might be some questions that we're going to have to just follow up with in the community and uh, follow up with there. But Jen, is there anything that we could try to address right now? Yeah, um, there's one question that I think could be really helpful to the the larger group, um, which is on updating data um, for your application. And the question is from Mika, and I apologize if I'm saying your name incorrectly, posted in the community. And he says, uh, if I need calculate or update the data in the data source based on the new input for UX, what would be the best way to do that? Should I try to do all the calculations in AppSheet and then update the data source uh, or in a or in primarily in the data source itself? Yeah, that's a that's a super good question. So I could, and I'll, I could yeah, Rich, go for it. I could, I could take that. So there's a couple of considerations you probably, you, I mean, yeah, you could do both, right? To be, you know, it depends on what solution you, you want to look at, but I would, if the, the 
uh, calculations are, are really complex and require, you know, uh, basically would slow down the front end um, of the, you know, the formulas you make in AppSheet. I would do them always in the in the table view. Um, however, if you do them in the table view, just keep in mind that the app itself won't be able to show that information, that newly calculated information, until the app gets synced again. So you need to kind of weigh the the the, the trade-offs, right? If I do it all in app sheet, users will see those calculations instantaneously as they happen, as the changes happen. Um, so you know, try to do it as much as possible in the in the app sheet itself. But if you've noticed that if you notice that your calculations get bogged down um, and the app gets slower, you know, depending on the complexity, I mean, it would take a lot to make it slow, but you know, it, it can happen. Uh, I would start looking at moving it to more of the back end um, type stuff. And it all, you know, there's a lot of factors that, you know, depend of wh whether, you know, your app gets slow or not. You know, the one, the primary ones, your, the amount of data that's in your app, right? And that's where security filters can also help out with. Awesome. Got it. Um... So I'm I'm just looking. Sorry, I'm also taking a look at some of the comments and the questions. And I think um, Jen, does anything stick out to you? Otherwise, uh, this might be a good good place to wrap it up and then follow up with individuals in the community thread. Yeah, I would agree. Great. Then I will. Um, I just wanted to first of all thank you, Rich, for sharing this application. Yay! <laughs> really your, great job, Rich. Yeah, and, and, yeah. I, th this application get better with everyone's help out there too. So if it, you know this kind of excites you, I have a couple volunteers already that have volunteered to basically make changes to the app. And you know if, if that that seems up your alley. Um, you basically, you know, just just reach out to me in that that forum post, and we'll uh, we could get started because there's a lot of opportunities with this idea, and you know, the the more we can make it better as a, a group, uh, the better everyone else will be. Awesome, and and um, and that just to recap on, on what we started with, this app is available in that uh, the the sample app directory, and that's um, you can access that from the community in a few different ways. Uh, we'll make sure that it's in this thread, and then um, if anyone has questions, feel free to just post them there or uh, uh, shoot us a note. We'll we'll make ourselves available for for follow up. Um, and then um, I I also just you know thank you thank you very much for taking the time to explore AppSheet and for to see if this can help with some of the solutions you're working on. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and sound. And, uh, and doing well, and we will will have uh, we'll continue to have these office hours. Um, Jen, was uh, was there anything else uh, you'd like to close with? I think uh, you hit all the high notes, Peter. Um, we'll be we'll see you all in two weeks. Stay safe, everyone, and you can catch us on the community. Until then, awesome. Thanks. <laughs>